Good morning, everybody. Today on Spotlight, a conversation with 11th District Congresswoman Haley Stevens. She'll be talking about the passage of the America Competes Act of 2022 in the U.S. House of Representatives. We'll also have a conversation with her about the political future of her district under redistricting. And later on our Sunday morning program, we'll take a deep dive into a conversation I actually began last week with Detroiter Lazar Favors of Black Spirit Legacy and very successful Maryland businesswoman and marketing expert, Dia Sims, co-founder of Proghorn. It's a Black History Month topic exploring a multi-million dollar spirits industry. It's Sunday, February the 20th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Representative Stevens, thanks for joining us today on Spotlight. You're doing okay? You're trying to stay warm and, and dry in all this snow and cold? Always, and enjoying my time home in Michigan and seeing so many friendly faces and getting out on the road. All right, very good. Uh, I know you're back in the district as we do this interview, but you were just recently in Washington, uh, and you had some good news. Uh, you had passage of the America's Compete Act of 2022. Um, what do you believe that's going to do for this nation? This is a tremendous piece of legislation. I'll tell you, we've been working on this for a long time. It's got supply chain provisions, STEM education dollars, equity provisions, so that we are bringing everybody into the scientific uh, research community, a doubling of our scientific research budget. But most importantly, what's in that bill, and this is big for the nation, but it's really big for Michigan, is the CHIPS Act, the funding for the CHIPS Act so that we can invest in the production of our semiconductor industry, meet the automotive supply chain needs and the workforce solution. So I am really fired up about this bill. I've been working on it for a long time, getting it passed through the house, being really, really close to final passage to get it to the president's desk for signature, innovate, compete globally, and make the American workforce shine. Do you see any major roadblocks on the Senate side? Actually, I do not. The Senate took a, a vote uh, earlier last year, uh, as a matter of fact, in a very bipartisan way. They, for once, went bigger than the House did, right? They gave us the big bill that we kind of coalesced around certain provisions of it. So there's a lot of energy around this. Our senators in particular, uh, Gary Peters and Senator Stabenow, have played a huge role. Uh, we're working closely with them. And, and, and look, it's it's a negotiation. It's not a political hot potato, but it's a negotiation right now. Folks know, though, that this is the right thing we need to do. How soon, once this bill gets you know, to the president's desk, it gets signed, how long will it take to actually see the fruits of the labor in terms of the yeah. manufacturing of that chip? Look, we're still projecting a tough year as it pertains to chips and the allocation of chips. In fact, as the year began, it showed that we were still experiencing and going to continue to experience slowdowns with uh, access to chips and the production of chips. This is complex production. These are clean rooms that you have to suit up on. You gotta have a really skilled workforce. We need to obviously invest in that pipeline. So look, it's not wave of one and solve the problem overnight, but what this does do, what this legislation does do immediately is it provides certainty and it gives permission to uh, manufacturers to come and invest here. You certainly heard about Intel's announcement just south of our border in Ohio. Not a bad day for Michigan manufacturers though, because that's regionally co-located. We've got different types of fabs that need to go in to the automotive types of chips too. We need to specialize. That's something that we've gotten in this legislation, a real priority for automotive and look, our folks are doing well. They're not saying that they're in a crisis like we were during the downturn of the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. But we need to take the small manufacturers into account. We need to take our supply chain because those guys are also really being squeezed. And we're still seeing temporary layoffs, some ricochets going back and forth with these supply right. chain disruptions. Right. And what we want to do is be juiced. We want to be making and selling and shining as we always do. All right, Representative, we need to take a quick little break. We'll hurry right back, uh, and we have some more questions. Uh, we'll take a look at the 11th District uh, redistricting and what changes might be in store coming down the pike. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Mm -hmm. 
and welcome back to Spotlight. Representative, uh, if there's been any criticism of the Biden administration, it is the fact that while we've got a lot of money coming in from Washington these days, and certainly uh, Governor Whitmer uh, won't complain about the amount of money coming to our state, it's inflation right now. And some are saying that the Biden economic agenda is not working. When we go pay gas at the gas pump, um, it's ridiculous compared to what we were paying just a couple years ago. It is ridiculous. The gas prices, the grocery prices, I was really proud to see this administration uh, bring the oil producers together to talk about lowering prices. Really proud to see this administration bring the grocers, uh, particularly the meat producers together to talk about lowering prices. But also very important to all of this, what we are working on in the House, and I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm in the Democratic majority, is we have a plan to lower the price pressures that Americans are experiencing day in and day out. The cost of prescription drugs, uh, this was through the roof before the pandemic, prices have only increased. I've got older Americans in my district who are afraid to go to the pharmacy to pick up their prescription. We all know the classic insulin story, being $1,000 here in the United States, just crossing over the border to Windsor and, and it being, a <laughs> you know, under a hundred bucks. We've got a disparity. We've got a bill to lower the cost of prescription drugs. It's in the Build Back Better provision. We need to get that passed. I'm a proud co-sponsor of it and have done it every time. Also, daycare costs. Daycare, uh, having gone through the roof and certainly being challenged during this pandemic, uh, we have in the Build Back Better provision uh, plans to make sure that Americans are not paying over 7% of their annual income for daycare. I've got so many folks who are saying, I'm paying my mortgage in daycare costs. So looking where we can immediately provide Americans relief and understanding that, yeah, people are paying more. It's not fair and we need to do something about it. I'm willing to work on it. I'm willing to talk about it and I'm willing to act. You want to retain representation of the 11th district, which you have been representing, uh, but you now look like you're going to have a challenge with uh, one of your colleagues, a Democratic colleague, uh, Andy Levin, as well as others. Uh, you got an endorsement from Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, who represented the 14th district, is now going to be retiring. Um, talk just a little bit about uh, that challenge and being pitted against one of your colleagues. Well, look, I am really enthusiastic about Michigan's new 11th district. It is an Oakland County seat. I have always represented the most of Oakland County of anyone in the delegation. I was so proud to receive the endorsement of my friend and mentor and a leader in the House of Representatives, Congresswoman Lawrence. She is shown to be a fighter for the 14th district, which includes cities in the new 11th district like Pontiac and West Bloomfield and Farmington Hills. Those communities continue to need a fighter and that's what I want to do. Congressman Levin got the endorsement of the Progressive Caucus. Is that a signal that you aren't going to be progressive enough for this district? I am really proud of my Democratic record. As you know, I've been a Democrat in a Republican leaning seat. This was one of the ones we flipped in 2018 to get the majority. And I have stood with the party on the $15 minimum wage, on climate provisions, on uh, uh, protecting the, the right to vote, our original co-sponsor of the Voting Rights Act. We need to get that done and, and on. So certainly getting the uh, rescue dollars through uh, for the pandemic and working very co co cohesively. I was co-president of the freshman class of Democrats in 2018, this amazing class of people who came in to right the ship of this country. And I'm really proud to campaign on my record of doing delivery and action for the people of Oakland County. You were friends before they did the redistricting. Will you be friends afterwards? And will you make a pledge as all the people are watching out now that no matter what happens, it will be a civil race between the two of you? It absolutely has to be. Look, Congressman Levin uh, is a friend. We both serve on the Education and Labor Committee. Uh, you, you don't wish this type of dynamic. A lot of respect for him and his family. Uh, and, and certainly the, the family uh, of service that, that he comes from. I've got that 
photo of me walking with his dad, Sandy Levin, in my first Labor Day parade. It's in my office in Washington, D.C. That photo isn't coming down. And, and when people ask me, you know, how are you guys different? I say, look, we voted together 96 percent of the time. We've co-sponsored the same bills. So I'm just connecting with people through my energy, my enthusiasm, not looking to do a takedown for, for any stretch of the means, because that's not what this is about. This is a, you know, a family consideration within the Democratic Party, and, and it's also about Oakland County and our future. Long time between now and August 2nd uh, when the primary, so we'll have plenty of time to talk to you and those who are running against you, and uh, we'll stay in touch. We'll be coming back to you. Thanks, Chuck. All right, it's our pleasure. Stay safe. And when Spotlight returns, I'll continue a conversation I started last week with Dia Sims and Lazar Favors on the opportunities and challenges for people of color in the very lucrative spirits industry. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Uncle Nears paved the way to start the history telling to make it, you know, to make it clear to our people and, and the communities of the spirit brands and where you spend your money and how intentional you should be about what you pay attention to. Um, and what's, what's been the reaction from the various audiences that you've had? And you're trying to do this in the pandemic as well, which I'm sure has presented <laughs> another challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's another challenge. But I think the reaction has been awesome, man. It's, it's, once you tell a story or, or enlighten someone about some things that's part of their history, I mean, because this is part of all of our history. This spirit is, is part of us, like dating back to 1800s, even further than that. Right. So when I when I tell the story, when they come in here, uh, when they when I introduce 40 brands that they've never heard of that are all black owned, that is that is something to take in. It's an incredible event. And I think it's important to, to tap into our history of celebration, our history of communion. Right. Is when there's spirits at the table, um, it, it's just so important to make a choice and be thoughtful about you know, kind of voting with your dollars. Right. Like if you look, if you got an at home bar and your friends are coming over on Friday, Look at your bar. Like, are there any black owned brands there? It's part of the reason why at Pronghorn, we were just thrilled to hear about this event. So we want to be a part of this. We want to be a part about exposing the fine, incredible spirits, our, our contributions in the history of the country to this industry, um, and also being part of shaping what the future looks like to make sure we have our fair seat at the table. Sure. Dia, from what yeah. I understand, you're trying to take this to a whole nother level from an economic development standpoint, um, you have considerable experience. You spent, what, 15 years of your life with Sean Diddy Combs. Uh, yes, indeed. Rose, your president. Daddy, Sean Diddy, brother love Combs. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know what you did, what you did for the Ciroc brand as well. Two, two billion dollar retail value brand, incredible. And that brand, all the success of that vodka was because we were able to be respectful and requited in the way we engage with minority communities, right? It wasn't the afterthought. It wasn't just a Black History Month budget. We were, we knew um, that this is a community that loves to celebrate with the best, wants to be able to make fine choices. And if you invite them and encourage them in a respectful and responsible way, you're gonna get just a boatloads of response in return. I'm looking at Lazar's backdrop. I know personally um, the Black people behind these brands and, um, you know, when we look at really every shopping decision we make at Pronghorn, we're starting with diversifying the spirits industry, but we're trying to learn and figure out how we take this and do it in other industries. And it starts with attending these type of events. It starts with voting with your dollars and making sure when you look at your pantry and your bar that you're buying, you know, black owned brands, minority owned brands. Dia, this is, a, I understand what, a 10 year initiative that you're really trying to push to try to open up this industry? Yes, it is a, um, and, and we, we will do this, right? So it is a 10 year initiative where we're gonna drive $2.4 billion of economic impact to the black community and the spirits industry. We really set it up as a template on how to effectively diversify any industry, any American industry. And we're starting with the spirits industry and we're starting with the black community in the United States. We are investing in black founders. Please check us out, pronghorn.co, if you have an idea, if you already have a, a gin or a whiskey, we want to hear about it. We want to help you get real capital 
real resources to be able to be impactful in this industry. And then we're also looking to hire people. We're gonna hire 1,800 people across the entire industry over 10 years. This is an industry where the average employee makes about $99,000 and they impact $1.2 million of top line revenue. We are well represented on one side of the bar. We are grossly underrepresented on the other side. And everything we do at Pronghorn will be to change that. All right, we need to take a quick little break. We're going to come right back to continue this conversation with the two of you. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Lazar, give us a little history because I think a lot of people are starting to now hear about the Uncle Nearest story. Um, a fascinating one. Everybody knew what Jack Daniels was. They it didn't everybody know about Uncle Nearest, but now I think a lot more people are learning. If you haven't learned yet, Google it. Fascinating story about what African Americans are doing yeah, and how they are expanding there in Tennessee and taking it to a whole nother level. Um, but there are lots of other people that have been involved with this industry for quite some time. And there's some newcomers, correct? That's correct. I mean, and Uncle some Nearest Michigan is ties. Yes, absolutely. I'm well, Uncle Nears, Uncle Nears is the fastest growing whiskey in American history. It's about the gentleman who taught Jack Daniels how to distill whiskey. I'm not going to go into heavy detail, but that's an amazing story. Um, and that story has, that whiskey has won numerous awards, over 120 awards in the last three years. Uh, they're introducing several different new uh, whiskeys. And I can't talk too much about it until, it until it's actually done. But in Michigan, in Michigan, we have a minimum of five, and we're we've probably introducing three three every month, right? Mm -hmm. Minimum of five available brands out of Michigan, uh, two out of uh, out of Grand Rapids, Stock the Bar, Motu Vigette, uh, F King Baca, and, and my a fan, my favorite because she went to Cast Tech with me is uh, Antil Tequila, which is great, which is great tequila. She's doing very well with that tequila. Uh, then you also have a brewer, you know, breweries. We have wine, Roche wine. It, it's just, a, it's, it's incredible to see these brands um, in, enter the market and try to sustain in this market. It's not, it's not easy. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's still a, a, a certain kind of driven industry, and it's hard for black brands who are not really fully, uh, I want to say, who may not have the, the, the capital. To, sure. to move forward in some of their brands. So it's, it's, it's a difficult journey, but it's, it's a journey that I'm willing to take with them. So. Sure. Dia, uh, paint a picture for us, uh, because you look at it at a national level now. Yes. Um, what percentage of African Americans or people of color, however you want to categorize it, are involved in this industry? And what percentage do we have of an industry that has been around as long as people have been around and been able to taste and sip? Yeah, so on average, it's um, we're about 12 to 16 percent of the industry in terms of on the sales side. In terms of presence, executive presence is less than two percent. Um, when you if you narrow it down to black women, it's less than one percent. And when you talk about overall participation, numbers fluctuate, but it's typically below five percent, um, which just doesn't make sense. And, and again, this isn't. Uh, I think it's important we hear. We, if you drink, we want you to drink responsibly. If you don't drink, it's just still a great industry 